Good day everyone, this is Chris back again with the Ancient Scholar and this is uh, video number 5 in a series of videos on uh, cardiovascular uh, pharmacology, clotting agent pharmacology for the respiratory therapist. And hopefully this will be the last video. I might have to push it into another video to get through the rest of the material um, that I have planned. So let's just go ahead and take a pick up where we left off. So now of going out of the um, anticoagulants and fibrinolytic medications, we're going to go ahead and talk about um, antihypertensive and diuretic medications. So an antihypertensive medication is simply a medication we use to treat hypertension or elevated blood pressure. And diuretics are medications that um, we use to um, pull fluid out of areas of the body and in some cases um, actually promote the elimination of fluid, particularly in the form of water and certain electrolytes out of the body. So let's just go ahead and talk about uh, the uh, some of the diuretic agents real quick. And it should be noted that these diuretic agents, because they do promote um, either the shift of fluid or the excretion of fluids, um, one of the effects of any uh, or of diuretic agents um, is in fact to decrease uh, the blood pressure. So a diuretic agent can decrease the blood pressure by uh, getting rid of uh, fluids. Um, so the first type and the most common type of uh, diuretic agents that we run into are known as loop diuretics. And loop diuretics actually work on an area of the kidney or the area of the nephron known as the um, loop of Henle. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you take a look at um, the structure of the nephron, I actually have a picture of it here. Um, I have the adrenal cortex here and the adrenal medulla here. Um, I have the Bowman's capsule right here. I have the, circu the circulation that comes in. Um, blood comes in through the capillary network and comes out um, through here. And this whole area here is known as the nephron or the functional unit of the kidney. Um, and then I have different components. I have the proximal convoluted collecting tubule, the loop of Henle here, uh, the distal convoluted collecting tubule, and then I have the collecting duct, which ultimately um, dumps into the ureter and goes into the urinary bladder. Um, and basically what I have is I have, um, I have excretion and reabsorption of uh, fluids and um, solutes occurring uh, along the whole length of the nephron. And um, certain areas involve certain electrolytes, um, and the diuretics take advantage of these certain areas. So if you look at loop diuretics, loop diuretics work primarily in the area of the ascending loop of Henle right here. And what the loop diuretics do is they prevent the reabsorption of sodium. If sodium gets reabsorbed back into the loop, um, there's a common saying that um, water follows sodium. And so if sodium doesn't get reabsorbed, water doesn't come back in and water stays out and the water eventually gets collected and um, obviously leaves the body through the uh, usual methods, the usual mechanisms. Um, so the loop diuretics primarily work here. Now along with uh, sodium, uh, in inhibition of sodium reabsorption, there is potassium reabsorption inhibition that occurs, and uh, the loop diuretics, particularly the, the most common one that we're going to talk about, Lasix, the trade name, or ferrosamide, the generic name, um, can cause hypokalemia, or a low potassium level. <clears throat> And often we will have to supplement patients that take loop diuretics um, with give them potassium supplements in the form of a, a usually a pill like Kador, um, Chloricon, or uh, other potassium supplement. Uh, the the loop diuretic ferrosamide is the most common type. It can be uh, given in uh, the oral form, PO, or even IV. Um, it's a very common oral um uh, diuretic patients um, go home on, and it, it is um, sometimes one of uh, the the uh, primary treatments for hypertension. Is often what we'll do is we'll put people on diuretics first before we treat them with other medications such as beta blockers and so on. 
Okay, so that's um, Lasix or furosemide. Another potential use for uh, loop diuretics um, or even the potassium sparing diuretic with uh, hydrochlorothiazide or HCTZ, which is underneath um, the loop diuretics, um, is for the treatment of congestive heart failure. Sometimes in congestive heart failure, uh, the heart uh, can get a little overloaded, fluid can back up in the lungs and get a little pulmonary edema. Um, what we're finding is that perhaps diuretics are not best for treating acute congestive heart failure. So if somebody is acutely decompensated or having acute problems, um, what we find is that in, in some cases, these patients aren't, in fact, fluid overloaded. They don't have too much fluid, and it's more of a, a heart issue. And um, diuretics can potentially be harmful to treat certain cases of congestive heart failure. It used to be in the days past that if somebody had congestive heart failure and they had wet lung sounds and uh, and all this, that one of the first medications we give is, is you know, um, a diuretic like Lasix or furosemide. And now we find that a lot of these patients, in fact, are fluid volume depleted and we may, it may have hurt them more through depleting more fluid and causing electrolyte imbalances than we helped. Um, in fact, uh, the last place that I flew at, we actually had to calculate something called the serum osmolality to um, see if our patient was, in fact, dehydrated or not before we could even consider giving uh, the, these diuretics. So there's a lot more thought that goes into giving diuretics for congestive heart failure. Um, some patients, we will uh, substitute the Lasix with HCTZ or hydrochlorothiazide um, which is a thiazide type diuretic, and it actually um, does not cause depletion of potassium, and so it's what we call a potassium sparing diuretic, um, and it actually works right up here. Um, so it's not in the loop of Henle itself; it works more in the distal convoluted uh, collecting tubule, um, and uh, it it does uh, spare the. Uh, it holds on to potassium, so hyperkalemia can be a problem. And sometimes patients that take salt substitute, um, salt substitute is very high in uh, potassium, and they can actually become hyperkalemic, so we need to be careful there. And then we have uh, a very special kind of diuretic called an osmotic diuretic. An osmotic diuretic is a relatively heavy molecule that exerts um, a lot of pressure a lot of osmotic pressure within the, the vessels, and that pressure actually pulls fluid from the cells. Um, the most common type of osmotic diuretic that we run into is something called mannitol or osmotol. And mannitol may be used for cerebral edema. Um, because it's a heavy molecule, it can it pull fluid out of cells that are swelling within the brain and help decrease that swelling. Um, so patients with severe cerebral edema, maybe they've had some sort of head injury or maybe an infection or something, um, you may see them um, be given uh, mannitol or osmotrol. Uh, mannitol is a very interesting medication. Um, it is prone to crystallization at room temperature. You see, you often have to keep it warmed or it will crystallize. Um, and you have to administer it through a filter. Um, and obviously, electrolyte imbalances are not uncommon with osmotic diuretics. <clears throat> okay, moving on to some uh, selected antihypertensive agents. So we talked a little earlier about beta blockers, and so I won't spend a whole lot of time on these, but um, not only can beta blockers be used to treat uh, certain types of tachycardias, um, but they can actually be used to treat hypertension as well um, by uh, blocking beta receptors, decreasing myocardial contractility, my, uh, heart rate, uh, chronotropy, um, dromotropy, and automaticity. Um, we talked about the nonspecific and what some of the hazards are of nonspecific and then the cardiac specific or cardioselective like metoprolol, esmolol. And then there's even a combined alpha and beta blocker um, and this is known as trandate or labetalol. And um, what it does is not only does it block beta receptors but it can block alpha receptors as well and cause vasodilation. Uh, the thing to know about labetalol is it is a much stronger beta blocker. It actually blocks about seven uh, beta receptors to one alpha, or seven to one. Um, so it, is, it does have a, a little bit of alpha blocking activity, but it's primarily a beta blocker. Um, and we'd also talked about the, the issues that you can run into giving non-specific beta blockers 
um, to patients that require beta agonist therapy, such as patients with a COPD. Another medication that is becoming a bit more popular uh, for treating congestive heart failure, um, in addition to hypertension, is an, uh, are the class of medications known as ACE inhibitors. Um, ACE inhibitors are rather interesting medications, and uh, to understand ACE inhibitors, you will need to go back and review your basic anatomy and physiology. I'm assuming that you have a decent understanding of anatomy and physiology uh, if you've gotten to this point. And obviously, uh, the first day of class, I uh, emphasized um, the importance of being well adept at anatomy, physiology, um, chemistry, organic chemistry, biochemistry specifically. But uh, if you remember back to anatomy and physiology, there's something called the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone cascade. And basically, the kidneys, um, when the kidneys sense that they are not being perfused adequately, uh, they release or secrete renin. And renin um, acts uh, upon um, the pituitary gland uh, to uh, secrete angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is then circulated to the lungs where ACE, or angiotensin converting enzyme, converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, its active form. Um, angiotensin 2 um, it then um, promotes the release of um, aldosterone. And uh, both angiotensin and aldosterone um, uh, uh, together have the effect of uh, causing vasoconstriction and have an antidiuretic effect where uh, they prevent the body from um, excreting water. So the body holds on to water and there's vasoconstriction. Um, the blood pressure can increase and uh, hopefully uh, that can increase renal perfusion and then once the kidneys are being perfused adequately they quit secreting uh, renin and there's a negative feedback mechanism there. Um, what we're finding is um, obviously breaking this cycle and by giving an ACE inhibitor. Uh, ACE inhibitors actually inhibit the um, ACE angiotensin converting enzyme and prevents it from converting angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, the active form. Uh, this is, is nice. If you can break that cycle, you can help the body uh, get rid of fluids and you can cause some vasodilation. This is very handy when it comes to um, treating hypertension. It's also handy because um, it promotes you know, the movement of fluid through the kidneys and it is uh, somewhat renal protective and breaking the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone cycle is actually a very effective way of treating congestive heart failure, um, particularly in the um, emergency in pre-hospital environment. We're finding that giving um, an ACE inhibitor to somebody with acute decompensated congestive heart failure, um, the ACE inhibitor may be very effective for helping those patients out. Um, examples of those include uh, lisinopril and enalapril, um, Prinavil is the other uh, name for uh, lisinopril, but uh, lisinopril and enalapril are the two most common uh, ACE types of ACE inhibitors you can run into. Um, lisinopril is generally oral. Uh, enalapril can be oral. Uh, sometimes it can be given IV as well. Um, and then just uh, uh, before I leave that, one thing that you need to monitor with ACE inhibitors is a risk for what's called angioedema. Angioedema is... Um, uh, sw significant swelling of the tissues that can occur, um, particularly a swelling of the airway, um, the tongue, and the oral mucosa. Um, this type of angioedema is not an allergic reaction. Okay, this is not an antibody antigen um, or an antibody related uh, reaction. This is not the immune system. This occurs through very different mechanisms. So you cannot treat this angioedema like you could an allergic reaction with epinephrine effectively. Um, this uh, sometimes requires aggressive surgical um, airway management or your patient can die. So that is a complication that you need to watch out for um, very closely and obviously it has very important respiratory implications. Um, some other medications are the alpha-blocking agents. Um, you can occasionally run into alpha-blocking agents. Um, clonidine, uh, or given orally, is a one such example of an alpha-blocking agent. blocks alpha receptors and causes vasodilation. And of course, we talked about the phentolamine, which is an alpha-blocker that we can give if I have infiltration of a catecholamine, a vasopressor, um, 
it's the antidote for that. Um, calcium channel blockers, not only can calcium channel blockers, as we discussed earlier, be used to treat uh, tachydysrhythmias like atrial fibrillation with rapid uh, ventricular response, um, but calcium channel blockers can cause smooth muscle relaxation and can uh, decrease myocardial contractility, dromotropy, inotropy, um, and chronotropy, um, as well as automaticity, and that can decrease uh, the blood pressure as well. So that's just a quick review of some of the major, some major antihypertensive agents. And we've talked about the beta blockers in a bit more detail earlier on in the uh, lectures that I've done. Okay, just some uh, other miscellaneous cardiovascular agents that I want to talk about. Um, we've talked a little bit about digoxin. I'll just review it real quick. Uh, major indication is heart failure, atrial fibrillation. If you guys remember, it's a positive inotrope and negative chronotropic agents. Um, digoxin is very interesting, and its toxicity is very common. Um, there are lots of interactions with multiple medications, and as you guys work through your drug cards, um, I would expect for you to note those. Uh, multiple, uh, multiple drug interactions. Um, toxicities are not uncommon. And one of the textbook, um, or one of the classic findings for digoxin toxicity is green halos around light uh, um, in your vision. So when you look at maybe a light or a light bulb or look out a bright window, you see green halos um, in your vision. And that is a textbook um, uh, symptom of digoxin toxicity. Digoxin is also significant, can cause significant proarrhythmic effects. And so digoxin can cause a whole myriad of cardiac conduction problems. Um, digoxin toxicity is especially problematic if my patient has an electrolyte imbalance. Um, even if the patient is not dig toxic, if the patient's potassium level um, becomes too high or too low, um, they can become ditch toxic um, regardless of the ditch level. Um, so we really need to watch their potassium. If a patient does become ditch toxic, there is an antidote called Digibind. Um, it is an antibody uh, for digoxin, and it is administered IV. Uh, the other medication is adenosine. We talked about that a little bit. It actually blocks... Um, the AV node it prevents impulses from getting through the AV node and in essence creates a block in the heart and prevents any of that information from getting from the atria to the ventricles and in essence stops the heart. Um, it's used to treat rapid uh, heart rhythms like SVT or supraventricular tachycardia. It can cause transient ha heart block or asystole. In a, a asystole, the layman's term is, is something called a quote-unquote flat line on the monitor. Um, if you put this link in to your browser, it'll bring you to an interesting YouTube video where you actually see uh, uh, the administration of adenosine to a patient in SVT, and you can actually see that patient develop um, a heart block and transient asystole, and the, the patient, of course, uh, um, has some interesting things to say about that. Obviously, um, you know, your patient can uh, have chest pain, they can become unresponsive. Um, something I really like to do with my paramedic students when they're working through their cardiac modules is they, they will give a denizen and then I will tell them that the patient is, is not responding and is in asystole, and they will immediately start doing CPR on the patient, um, forgetting that, hey, um, the transient heart block or asystole may, is very common with adenosin. A uh, thing to know about adenosin is it needs to be given very rapidly. Its half-life is very rapid, about six seconds. Um, so you need to give it a rapid IV uh, push, followed by a rapid bolus of, of normal saline to get that medication into the central circulation as, as quick as possible, otherwise it's not effective. You generally will give 6 milligrams IV push, wait a minute, you can give a second dose of 12 milligrams IV push, wait another minute, and you can give a third and final dose at 12 milligrams um, rapid IV push. And then you have to move on to other medications or other uh, considerations that that doesn't work. Uh, another medication that we run into is atropine. Um, you guys are at, at this point should be familiar with atropine because we've talked about it um, already, and we've talked about a derivative of atropine called atrovent um, or ipotropium. Ipotropium is an atropine derivative. Um, it blocks the parasympathetic nerve system, so it's an anticholinergic agent. Atropine can be used to dry secretions. 
when you're going into intubate and somebody has lots of secretions, you can use it to dry secretions. And obviously, you can use it to increase the heart rate or treat bradycardia. Um, atropine is, gen and when used to treat uh, bradycardia, it's given um, IV push, uh, 0 0.5 milligrams. IV push in the adult is a common dose. Occasionally, we will give it to pediatric patients because when we intubate pediatric patients, they can be prone to bradycardia from um, stimulation of the vagus nerve. So it's not uncommon to premedicate um, pediatric patients with atropine to prevent bradycardia during intubation, something you guys will actually talk about next semester when you start your invasive airway management um, uh, training in a lab and lecture. Um, another medication is called vasopressin or patrecin, and yes, it is the vasopressin um, that you should remember for anatomy and physiology. It is a hormone. Uh, the other name for vasopressin is ADH, or antidiuretic hormone, and it is a hormone that causes the kidneys to hold on to water to prevent diuresis. Um, we can administer vasopressin um, in the emergency setting, um, generally to treat severe hypotension and GI bleeding. Somebody is bleeding internally from uh, their intestines or uh, from their gastrointestinal tract. Um, vasopressin is interesting in that it is not an adrenergic. It does not work on alpha-1 receptors. Vasopressin actually has its own receptors, V1 and V2 receptors, which cause vasoconstriction to occur through a, a different mechanism of action than the G-protein coupled reaction that we've already talked about when it comes to the adrenergic response. Um, so it's actually effective in treating uh, certain types of hypotension, such as somebody who's been in um, septic shock for an extended period of time. Sometimes we can give them, you know, septic shock patients, we can give them the levofed or the norepinephrine or the dopamine, and their adrenergic receptors will downregulate and become tolerant. And sometimes the pressors will no longer work on these patients, and we can... Uh, look at possibly giving them something like vasopressin um, to cause vasoconstriction um, when other medications fail. Um, another uh, fairly recent, within the last five or ten years, uh, uh, indication for vasopressin is cardiac arrest. Um, in cardiac arrest, we generally give 40 units rapid IV push, and we'll talk uh, more about that um, when we take ACLS. Um, if you are giving a continuous infusion for hypotension or GI bleed, you need to be very careful about somebody that has heart issues, um, ischemia of the heart. This can exacerbate ischemia. Um, the last miscellaneous agent I want to talk about is a very common agent called nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin is very common. Lots of people have nitroglycerin. And nitroglycerin is a nitrate that works by increasing um, levels of nitric oxide in the vessels, and nitric oxide acts to cause vasodilation. Um, so nitroglycerin is commonly used to do, treat chest pain related to acute uh, coronary syndromes or chronic coronary artery disease. Somebody can have stable ischemia, or stable angina, excuse me, um, chronic angina, where they, they have some chest pain, but it goes away if they, they relax and they'll take nitroglycerin. Or we can give nitroglycerin um, along with aspirin as a frontline medication for suspected acute coronary syndrome. Um, generally, what we'll do is if the patient's blood pressure is not low, okay, the blood pressure is not low, and we've looked at their EKG and we are sure that their right ventricle is safe, which is don't worry about that. That's something that I'm going to be talking about in a few semesters and when you guys go through your ECG uh, training in lab and lecture. Um, you can give 0 0.4, 400 micrograms sublingual underneath the tongue, either a spray or a tablet. You wait five minutes. If the patient um, is still having pain and their vital signs are good, you can give another four, 0 0.4, 400 micrograms. Wait another five minutes and give a third and final 0 0.4, 400 micrograms. Um, occasionally, we can administer nitroglycerin as a continuous infusion. You, uh, we typically will mix 25 milligrams and 250 mils of D5W, dextrose 5% water, and we will um, administer anywhere from 5 to several hundred micrograms per minute. Generally, you'll start off low, like 5 to 10 mics per minute, 
and then increase or titrate the infusion up to decrease that patient's chest pain um, or you know or uh, to obviously um, we got to watch the vital signs and make sure that we don't drop their blood pressure um, nitroglycerin uh, a lot of people say that nitroglycerin dilates the coronary arteries and that uh, allows more blood to get into the heart and that's actually what treats ischemia and to some extent that may be a mechanism however the major mechanism of action is nitroglycerin causes vasodilation dilation of the venous system and what that does is that decreases the amount of blood coming to the heart it decreases preload to the heart and that uh, ensures that the heart doesn't have as much blood to pump so the heart doesn't have to work as hard now the heart can relax a little bit and if it doesn't have to work as hard it's not getting as much blood um, then it's not using as much oxygen and it's not um, as ischemic as it would um, be that seems to be a major indication or major mechanism of action for nitroglycerin um, it should also be noted that nitroglycerin um, is a medication that can be used to treat congestive heart failure. A major interaction that you have with nitrate-like medications like nitroglycerin is if somebody is taking a medication for erectile dysfunction like sildenafil. Um, sildenafil has a very similar m mechanism of action, but it, it, it uh, causes the release of nitric oxide. And that can uh, treat help treat erectile dysfunction. Uh, one of the interactions you get with giving nitroglycerin with another medication like sildenafil or Viagra um, is you can have a very low blood pressure result from giving those two medications together. So it's very important to ask people um, if they have taken sildenafil within 24 hours. If they have, it is probably not a good idea to give the nitroglycerin. Okay, guys, uh, almost done here. I just want to hit real quick on epinephrine. I know I've talked about this in prior lectures. Um, just uh, for uh, dire emergencies, uh, I just want you to remember, if I have an anaphylactic reaction, the dose of epinephrine is a 1 to 10,000 concentration IM, 0 0.3 milligrams for an adult patient or 0 0.15 milligrams for a pediatric patient. Now, if my patient is in cardiac arrest, instead of using the 1 to 1,000 concentration, I use the 1 to 10,000 epi, and that's what I have here. Um, in that case, if they're in cardiac arrest, I give 1 milligram of 1 to 10,000 every 3 to 5 minutes. Um, if it is a pediatric patient, I give 0 0.1 milliliters, or 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram, but 0 0.1 milliliters per kilogram is an easier number to remember of 1 to 10,000 IV push every 3 to 5 minutes for pediatric patients. Okay, guys, that's the end of this uh, entire lecture series. I hope you found this helpful. I hope you've enjoyed these videos. And as always, thank you so much for hanging in there.